God is good. God calls us to things we have no idea God had thought of for us. God thinks of these things and puts them in our hearts and the hearts of other people. And how many of you are in ministry right now because someone said, you know, you should be... How many of you have, have had that experience? Okay. You should, you should come and do this. How many of you are extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion? Or going to be? How many of you are uh, lectors, leaders? How many of you are cancers? How many of you are maintenance people in the parish? Because that's what we do. <laughs> in ministry, ministry's other, other word is, uh, you know, maintenance or janitor, cleanup. When we're called to ministry, it's really amazing to think what God is doing in us. Who am I? How many of you have ever thought, who am I to be called to offer the body and blood of Christ to others. Who am I? Have you ever thought of that? You're, who am I to, to, to reflect and proclaim the living word of God, the living word, the real presence of Christ in the word of God to others? Who am I to sing the psalm and to lead others in prayer so that they can be filled up with song? And you know there's nothing like music and song to create the body of Christ. If you just have this imagination of that sound of the people of God. Did you notice that I sang real softly after you guys got the melody? Because I love hearing you. And so when you are singing, you are one body of Christ in sound. This beautiful body of sound is the body of Christ. Like nothing else brings us together like nothing else. And if you can't sing good, sing loud. <laughs> yes. Because you know why? Other people around you will think, oh my gosh, I better sing louder than over <laughs> <laughs> But also, especially your children, your children will say, oh, mom, dad, don't sing. Well, sing louder because then they'll sing over you, right? And remember, Psalm 50, 150, Psalm 150. Make a joyful noise. Noise, right? So, as we think about God and who God is, who is God for you? In an elevator, you meet someone, and maybe you've got, let's say you've got some little something like bulletin from, from church with you. You have to have it with you on the things. And they're like, oh, you, you go to church. You know, I, I, I had no experience growing up with church, God, or anything. Who, who, who is God for you? Why is that such a compelling thing for you? What would you answer? Do you have literally an elevator speech? Who is God for you? Okay, so I want you to turn to your neighbor right now, and in one sentence, and then this is like a 30 second exercise. God is ready, go. God is good. God is good. God is the Lord. God is my peace, my mercy, yeah. my Savior. Yeah. 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 Fifteen seconds. Yeah. Oh, wow. God is good. Yeah. Everything. It's peace. My Happiness. 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 Yeah. Joy. Salvation. God is good. All the time, God is good. Yeah. You didn't have a lot of time. Um, anybody have something that really just is compelling to them? How many? How many would found this easy to do? How many of you found this easy? Two. Oh, five, ten, twenty. Okay, some of you found it easy to do. Many people don't find it easy to do because it's a bit a lot of. There's so much. God is everything. God is so much. Anybody want to just say one sentence or anyone? God is everything. God is everything. Anyone else? God is my peace. God is my peace. God is love. God is my guide. God is my guide. Daniel. D-A-N-I-E-L. E-L is God in Hebrew. Dan is
is the judge. God is my judge. No pressure, right? <laughs> Who is God? And how do you know and then experience God? It's really important that you think about this because there are people who need to hear your story. You're involved, you're church people, right? But we need to remember this too, and we need to write it down. Nobody yet said, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Which is the most important thing for us to understand about God, because God is a relationship. And the, the love between the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. And that's the power that we have after we've been baptized, is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we are who we are. And God has us. God is us. God is in us and with us and is in part of our being. Yes? No way. There we go. So, the Creator, the Merciful Father, the Jesus, human, just like us, and Savior, who reconciles and unites people. It's so important to remember that Jesus was truly in every way human. And Holy Spirit, who baptizes us, accompanies us, inspires us, and strengthens us for our ministry. So here is one of the, okay, if you look and you can see that tiny little word, is an anaphora of St. John Chrysostom. You're going to learn a new word today. If you don't know the word anaphora, it's a Greek word that means prayer. It's one of the, it's anaphora is a Eucharistic prayer. We have four main anaphoras. Eucharistic prayer, one, two, three, and four. Then we have about 12 others that are, that are in our Roman Missal and, and, and elsewhere. This is in the Eucharistic prayer of St. John the System from the fourth century. He said, it is just and necessary to sing to you. This is God, right? To sing to you, to bless you, to praise you, to thank you, and to worship you. Let's all say this next time together. For you are God. Ineffable, incomprehensible, invisible. Invisible, beyond understanding, eternal, immutable. You and your only begotten Son and your Holy Spirit. And we have one job. I love when someone said, you had one job. Are you doing that job? What's that job? To sing to him. All three persons of the Trinity. To sing to God, to bless God, to praise God, and to thank God, and to worship God. That is our job. That is our call. That is our mission. To do that. We're called to do that. And your ministry allows others to do that. So we have this divine economy. This divine beauty. And you see it's cyclical. It goes around and around. Well, he goes, Father, the Word made flesh is Jesus Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is incarnation and his Paschal mystery. What is the Paschal mystery? It's the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ. And ascension. And we live that Paschal mystery every day in our lives. And we celebrate it every time we do any of the sacraments. The Paschal mystery of Christ is present again. It's the visible image of the Father sent down here on this earth to show us the Father who is love and who is mercy. Amazing. But this has a crucial and important and critical energy to it. Our relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit begins and ends, well, it begins with baptism, but the source of our ongoing life is what? The very source of our life. The most important source of our life. The absolute is up there. <clears throat> it's down the slide. The source of our life. Jesus. And you are a part of it every Sunday. Amen. What is it? Hmm? Right? Look at that up there. Where, where, it's right there. The divine liturgy. It's the Eucharist. It's the encounter with Christ in the Eucharist. The encounter with Christ in the Eucharist. Can you imagine any other faith having the 
chutzpah, that's Jewish, meaning strength and many other things, to say, God, come, be with us here, truly, really, and absolutely present among us in four ways. In the proclamation of the word of God, the true presence of Jesus is in that word. In the Eucharist itself, the sacrament, Jesus is truly present because what do we do? We say, the Lord be with you. I didn't hear you at all. Come on. You can do this, right? I know it's morning, but we just prayed. So let's get excited. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. I believe you. Why did I say the Lord be with you? Because the Lord is not with you. Whenever we have a sacrament, we always are celebrating the sacrament, and we squawk into the sacrament because there's something missing. There's a lack. I go into baptism because I need to become a part of the Christian community. I need to be, I need to die to my old self and be reborn in Christ. I am called to, to Mass every, every time I can go, but particularly every feast day and a holy day and Sunday. A ritual feast day. Why? We're obligated, but in a sense, we have to go. It's who we are. So we, we don't have Christ. We have Christ in our in us. Yes, we're all part of the body of Christ. And Christ is in us because we're baptized. But the real presence of Christ is not with us. And so we say, the Lord be with you because the Lord is not with us. And we say, and with your spirit. spirit. And then we say, lift up your hearts. Why do we say lift up your hearts? Because we're not lifting up our hearts. Right? So the priest says, lift up your hearts. And we say, we lift them up to the Lord. Oh, yeah. Nah. Lift them up to the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you do in liturgy is not simply what you would do when you're watching a movie, or you're sitting on the red liner with snacks, <clears throat> or you're walking down the street, or you're at the end of the day. You wish you had some coffee. No, it's your full being immersed in this experience of if Jesus walked up to you today, would you say, with your strength? We don't come up to the one. You're like, Jesus, praise God. We lift the hope to the Lord, you, right? I lift it up to you, right? Wouldn't you do that if he was right in front of you? Well, guess what? He is. Lift up your hearts. You lift them up to the Lord. Now I'm believing you. Let, why do you say let us do thanks? Because he is right and just. The, you use deduction. Because I've done it from the first one, the second one, and now I'm doing it from the third one. Why do you say let us do, let, let us do thanks? Because, because that's indeed. justice. Because we're not giving thanks. There's a lack. We're not doing things. So, the Lord be with you. Why? Because the Lord's not with me. So the priest says, the Lord be with you. He's proclaiming that the Lord be with you. And you're saying, it with your spirit. And now, here we are. There's a lack. Lift up your hearts. Why? We're not lifting up our hearts. But he says, lift up your hearts. And you say, okay. Uh, we lift them up to the Lord. And you do. You do. This is what is all that's required. The next one is the key. Let us give thanks, thanks. 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 To, to the Lord, Lord our God. God. What does Eucharistia mean? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. In, 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 uh, in Greek it means Thanksgiving. Let us give Eucharistia. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. Yeah. Yes. So when you have that dialogue with the priest just before the Eucharistic prayer, it's a really important moment. And it engages you into the Mass in a holy way. Because the next prayer is not the priest's prayer. Father, all power from the heaven of God, it is right to give you thanks and praise. All life, all holiness comes to you through the Lord. You know that prayer, right? You hear it on Sunday, it's that long practice prayer, right? And it's a little different every Sunday. It's wonderful. He talks about all the great things God has done. It's not his prayer. Whose prayer is it? Our prayer. Whose? 
our prayer. It's our prayer. And he is the altar Christus. He's the other Christ. He is the, the conduit of gathering all our prayers through the priest. So he is no longer himself. As sinful as humans are, priests are great, but some are not. You know, everyone's different. You're, you're human, right? At that moment, he's not that man. He's all the priests. He's in the role of Christ at the table, at the Last Supper. And proclaiming the good news of what God has done to us. And then we are so excited about that news that not only are we going to sing this song, but guess who gets to sing it with us? And now with all the angels and, and saints. Angels and saints. The choir of angels. And if you sing loud enough, you will hear those angels. I promise you. <laughs> I heard one. Why? Why I told the kids in our school, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. They don't sleep. They're still awake. Not they're still awake. I said, if you sing loud enough, you will hear the angels. And one morning, it's all so still. They did. And they raised the roof. And I truly have heard angels. Not just these little angels, but I heard truly God. Really, in a way, just laughing and singing with us. So it's so important that the divine liturgy is a part of this wonderful circle that we are moving through with Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and this relationship that we have with them. We are called to share the excitement of that experience with others, too. Because what is it? It's an encounter. Christ is an encounter. So, what is the theology of the ministry? We can hear it in one of these prayers. This is a prayer from the writing of the Catholic Church. Almighty God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, has freed you from sin. sin. Are you happy about that? Yes. Amen. Given you new birth. birth by water and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. And it's joined you to his people has joined you. Look around. Just look at look at your neighbors. Just look. You are now joined to that person. It's the same person. You are. He now anoints you with the crystal of salvation so that you may remain as a member of Christ. Priest, prophet, and king unto eternal life. So look at your neighbor again. They are a priest. Look at your neighbor again. They are a king. Or a queen. Look at, your, look at your neighbor again. They are a prophet. So, priest, prophet, and king. What does that mean when we're with ministry? What does that mean? It means that as a priest, we offer sacrifice for others. And we're called to holiness. You are a priest forever. In the order of Melchizedek. There's a wonderful thing about it in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And you have these, these items on your little handout, right? You've got all these slides, right? All these things, the hardship of life, if, if patiently born through the Spirit, become spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Did anybody's mom or dad ever say, offer it up? <laughs> I know, honey, it's hard. Just offer it up. It's called redemptive suffering. We can redeem the world and the lives of even others if we offer our suffering to the Lord on behalf of someone in need, or even ourselves. Prophet, you are a prophet because you proclaim God's word and you reshape society. Think about all the prophets. Were they popular? No. Almost never. Were they wealthy? Yeah. Almost never. Were they, when people, when they prophet walked into the room, did everybody say, hey, great to see you? Often, no. But they were, okay, this is not a very good analogy, the Jimmy Cricket. You know, they were reminding and say, pointing back to God, what did God say? And they're watching and they're saying, King David, what did you do to Bathsheba's <laughs> husband? You killed him. We don't want to hear our own sinfulness. We don't want to face it, honestly. Because if sometimes we face it, it's too great, it's too scary, it's too big. And I, I, I really suggest that in our society right now, 
We have a lot of societal things. And they're not just like, oh, you know, stuff you see on the news or whatever. It's a way of life. It's a way of life. And those who have chosen a countercultural way of life, which I, I imagine that you do, you put things before other things that other people don't do. But that shapes society. You don't need to be quiet about it, but you also don't need to be self-righteous about it, either like the, like the Pharisees. But you need to be open to say, oh, it's such an amazing day. I went to adoration. What's that? I spent an hour praying to Christ in the middle of the church, and it's such a holy place. And Christ gave me a couple of messages. Yeah, I wouldn't need to tell you. What are they?
the word was there and you needed it so bad. Yeah, right? All the time. It happens to me every single day, daily meeting. Okay, God, what are you doing here, God? How did you know? <laughs> of course you do. But how you proclaim it and all the other things around that, how long you pray over that meeting. How many weeks you pray over that one meeting before you proclaim it? Because it needs to become you. You need to become it. And it needs to have changed your life before you read it. Right? Driving down Beltway 8 with all the traffic. And I'm, and I'm remembering what I've been reading every day. That God is there for me. And will protect me. Like the breastplate of faith. And the shoes of Helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Just heard that the other day. So you use your gifts. Now, how many of you are singers? So you guys have special gifts of singing, and you're called out because you have this gift. And it is a gift that must be honed. People do not realize how long it takes to hone the gift of music. It takes years of practice every day. Years and years and years and years. And you have to keep doing it as you get older, or else it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. I have to say, right? <laughs> Those gifts. So you're set apart. You all are set apart for service. Because you increase the confident team. And what it says in confirmation is be living members of this church and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, seek to serve all people like Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve. So, what's your purpose? Called by God to fulfill a need, continue the same work of Christ, to build up the kingdom, and there's a big difference between a volunteer and a minister. I just want you to really meditate on the difference between a volunteer and a minister. The priests of the community of faith are active in different ways in the Eucharist sacrifice. The ordained priest represents Christ. All the baptized participate in the priesthood of the Savior as both priest and minister. The Savior's priesthood. So what does that mean for our spirituality? How does it change us? How does it help us to grow closer to Christ every day? And how, how does it help us with our families? With, our, with, with all our, our neighbors and friends? What is spirituality? It's a personal encounter with our Lord. A personal encounter with our Lord. So think about your own personal encounter. Have, did you have, like, when you were young, or maybe you were older, some kind of encounter that was clearly the Lord, very clearly the Lord? Was it a retreat? Was it a time in your life when you were you were just at the end of your rope and something happened? Was it a person that came into your life and clearly you saw the hand of God or something? Was it a situation that just shifted and you had no reason to know this hand of God and you realized that was God? Transition? Was it a sacramental experience? Spirituality is a way of being and it's a way of life. So there's three essential parts of authentic spirituality. Identify your spirituality. What is it that helps you pray and grow closer to Christ? There are many different kinds. Uh, you see Franciscans, right? Franciscans like to go out and help the poor. It's like an active spirituality. They live out their spirituality by doing things out with people who are on the margins, right? Think of, think of Francis, what he did. Then there's Jesuit spirituality, which is rooted in the scripture and contemplation and taking all the things in my life and reflecting on them through those scriptures and walking through the walking through the way of Christ in a, in a contemplative, in a reflective way to help me grow and be a new person in this world. There's charismatic, devotional, there's active ministry, there's outreach, there's Marian spirituality. There's so many different things that people find that are like touchstones, right? Why do we have rosaries? Because they're touchstones. You can hold them, right? Some people have found on the retreat a rock. Okay, I'm going to hold that rock and I'm going to put a cross on it. I'm just going to picture me and my little prayer table. I'm going to remind
mighty that he experienced on that retreat. So you are unique in your own spirituality. What is it? And, and you might be saying here, I, I don't know what it is. Well then, Google it. It's my three children or something. I'm going to ask my daughter to read three. What is what that? And she's like, she sends me this text. And it's L M. Um, let me Google that let for me you. Google that for you. <laughs> and I, I did a new question. And it goes, Google. Like, oh, okay, I get it. But I'm, I'm really, there's a lot of people in your lives that could be great. Let me Google that people for you because I can go to you and say, what is your spirituality? What do you do to pray? How do you get closer to God? And what does the family do? How many have family things that you do? Spiritual stuff, things like praying to the table of Advent. Advent reads. How about, how about um, something you do on a special feast day? No? Nothing? St. Joseph altars, you know. Go uh, drink green beer on St. Patrick's Day. So, the Catholic Book of Household Blessings and Prayers is your friend. And if you have a family, grandkids, or your own children, find ways, like coming up, find ways to do something about the saints. For all saints and all Hallows Eve, right? But this spirituality is going to feed you. And the first and most important part of this, where it starts and ends, the source and the summit of our spiritual life is, we said it once at the beginning, and you serve this every Sunday. <laughs> the Eucharist. The Eucharist. It's the source and summit of the Christian life. Nothing more important in our Christian life than the Eucharist. Jesus said it, and the church says it. Nourish your spirituality, feed your spiritual life, and keep it alive. What happens when you start with something? It dies. Regularly nourish it. Mass, good through devotion, prayers, being in a group. Sometimes people just need other people around the table. Then put your spirituality into practice. Regular spiritual practice strengthens and maintains your spiritual life. Daily prayer, liturgy the hours. Like you're doing outreach, you name it. There's so many things that can help deepen your relationship with Christ. Hey, guess what? Being here today. And what is formation? What is spiritual formation? So, formation is growing in our relationship to God. Spiritual formation is growing in relationship with God, with Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And spiritual formation for ministry is growing our relationship. God in Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit in order to serve the needs of the body of Christ. And that's why you're here today. So the spiritual practice of the Eucharist is our daily bread, as we're saying. And that sacramental encounter through Christ is the mystery of God seen through the struggle, pains, and joy in ministry and in life. So we're called to live the Eucharist. The liturgy is the, is, the, is the entry point and the catalyst to God's transformation of the world. If you pray over the Eucharistic prayer, you will see parts of that prayer that call us to deeper and deeper relationship with God and to give up so much of who we are so that we can become God and God makes us even more who we are, more completely who we are. And so the liturgy nurtures, feeds, fosters us, and it's your experience of the encounter with Christ. Between humanity and God, that's what's happening. We say, God, come down. God says, yes, I love you. I will send the Spirit to make Christ present on that table, just like he did 2,000 years ago. And that's at the heart of prayer. That's the heart of the spiritual life. So, Stop, look, and listen. It's mindfulness that we need, especially when you serve. We're living this spiritual practice of mindfulness. And mindfulness will help you to understand where, what God's trying to tell you through the experiences of life. You know, you just kind of walk through in a, in a haze, right? How many of you have been in Mass? You have to raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> been in Mass, and all of a sudden, you're standing up for the Alleluia. Oh, what, what was the first reading? What was the psalm? What was it? 
you were focused on a little kid over there, you'd be curious off the floor, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> or you were daydreaming about something that's on your mind, right? Guess what? That's God working in you. Even in the distractions, God is there, right? God is in the distractions. So that's the crucial thing you ought to hold on to just a minute. Even, even, the, even the sacred liturgy uh, document, talks about the Constitution on sacred liturgy, says, Mother Church earnestly desires that all the people should be led to full, conscious, and active participation in liturgical celebration, which is demanded by the nature of the liturgy. So, your job when you are ministering is to notice. What do you want to notice? The sacramental encounter with Christ. It's not something always that's going to be super pious. Maybe it's something little. Somebody did a reflection on, we got new patents for the server, and one little server was looking at his face in the patent, kind of going, kind of messing around with it, right? <laughs> she got so much out of laughing, but then praying about what God is, and how God sees us, and how God is looking back at us, and all these different things that she it just came to her by that one distraction. So engage your senses. Listen with the ear of the heart. That's what St. Benedict said in his in Benedict and Rule. Listen with the ear of your heart. And see and hear the powerful symbols and texts that you're seeing with new eyes, with new ears. How do you do that? You learn about the liturgy. That's what you're doing. Though. You're learning. And then give your focus and attention to God's action. What's God doing? And presence in the liturgy and your ministry. We often go to liturgy and it's like a spectator sport. It's like going to the theater. No, 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 no. What does liturgy mean? The work of the people. Liturgy. The work of the people. We go not to get something, but to give. And in the giving, what do we do? We receive. We give praise. We give song. Remember we say we give thanks. We give praise. That's why we're going. We're going to Mass to give thanks to God. And asking God to be with us. Fill us. But notice how you exercise servant and spiritual leadership in your life. These are all things you can notice. So there's four steps. These four steps are your spiritual practice after you serve. One, identify an experience of ministry at Mass. It was significant to you. There's a lot of different ways you can think about it, but remember the details. Two, find one of the prayers of that mass, a reading, a song or a text, even a word. Then pray it. And in prayer, ask God to help you to reflect on your experience, your feelings, and what it might mean to you. What does God hope to teach me or share with me or understand? Then write down your thoughts. That's two. Three, imagine God speaking to you directly. Uh, yeah. Ask God to speak to you. Listen and try to reflect. If you don't hear anything, that's okay. He will eventually understand something new. And maybe your brain is what's going to be working, and that's God in you, right? Don't be sad if you don't hear God. Mother Teresa went 40 years not hearing God, not even one through it, not even knowing that he was there. But she was faithful. And look what filled in her real history. So reflect then on prayer, in prayer, on the insights that come to you. And try to discern what is God's guidance to me. I was looking at those Cheerios, I was really upset. Uh, there's a woman in my choir, I'm just saying my, my story, who slurped this big old thing of water right when the priest, everything was silent, told me about this. And I was like, Shame, blame, all these things going on my head. And all of a sudden I stopped and I said, okay, I can't do anything about this. And they're real crunch, right? So all the people are, I think, are looking. I just refocused. And later I began to pray over this. And I realized, guess what, Dan? You are not God. You're not in charge of those people's spirituality. You're not in charge if they were distracted or not. That's not up to you. Don't take that on. Let go and know that I am God. God. I 
am God and you are not. <laughs> so even that thing can be a wonderful source of reflection for you. I tripped and embarrassed myself. I had to deal with a person who was running off with a host of it because he had the first communion, I guess. All these things happen, but Christ is in them all. Write down your reflections when asked by any leader, if you're doing this like as a group, share your understanding of God's message with your neighbor and listen to them too. We were gonna do that here, but we didn't have time really. But I want you to take time to do that with people back in your neighbor here. And finally, discern the new insight and reflect on how you might put it into practice. Because putting that into practice is the key. You have experiences, don't you forget about them. The only way you can put them in practice is by sharing them with others, reminding others to think about their experiences well. So share an understanding, what did you learn? And then use this. It's, it, there's a name for it. It's called mystagogia. Can you say that word? Mystagogia. Yeah. All right, so you learned two new words. Did you know these words? Anaphora. Uh, and mystagogia. Prayers. Mystagogia means unpacking or understanding the mysteries of our faith, the sacraments. There's a whole period of like new Catholics time in their lives where they understand and unpack the mysteries of what happened to them at initiation. So you might consider doing this with another minister or another group. And it's a beautiful thing to do. So there's a reading here you could use, and there's some questions you can use, and there's some discussion that you can use. But mostly, it's time to go. And I hope I've helped you with any questions of, of, about this thing. But I will be here all day, and you can ask these questions at a person I can show you. So now you're going to your ministry. If you're at EMAC, you stay here in, in English. If you are a lecturer, you turn right, and then you turn left. You follow the signs. And then you turn left again and go all the way down to the kindergarten classroom. It's an awesome place. You got a great road. This is God loves you. And then if you're a cantor, you're gonna go out that way to that what used to be an old church as the youth building. And we'll be right in the middle of that youth building. Yes, sir. Whenever you're leading formation for liturgical ministers, aside from the technical aspects, what is the most important thing to get across? When you're leading formation for other ministers when they come to you, what is the most important thing? Like, like what's the one thing, right? What's the one thing? Here's the one thing. Here's the one thing. God loves you more than you can imagine. That's the one thing. And what does God... How does that show that? In the encounter with Christ in the Eucharist. The encounter. Is what I experience in the Eucharist really an encounter? Because it might be if I bring more to it, right? God loves you more than you can imagine. You will not believe how many people can't imagine how God loves them. Read Psalm 149. No matter where, 139. However, I can run from your love. I, I try to go to the highest heavens and the down in the darkest depths of shale. Still, you run after me. You love me. What did I imagine? So many people don't have any idea, and they can't think of God as anybody who loves them at all, or they're unlovable. That message alone is saved lives. Amen. Amen. Has God bless us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, or will not end. Amen. Our Lady of La Salette, pray for us. Pray us. As the patron of this building, may God bless us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Peace be with you. And with you, sir. Thank you, Dan. God bless you. You guys are awesome.